Welcome to another episode of Legacies of Lore, brought to you by MTG Training Grounds, the educational series dedicated to providing you with all the info on popular decks, strategies, insight, and more for the Legacy format. I'm your host, Zachary Cuck. For today's episode, we're going to shift our attention from decks and archetypes and some of like the classes of cards and instead focus on a single card. We have a lot of requests to go into even um, deeper interaction and, and more, more focus on a single card. Um, and I, I think that this may be a good way for, for players who are both new and, and old uh, to appreciate the nuance uh, that the format has and, that, and that some of the individual cards bring to it. Um, but the question is, what should we start with? You know, there's a whole lot of sort of key uh, defining cards in the format, um, but I don't know. But I wasn't sure where to start. So you, you know, the popular requests were brainstorm, lightning bolt, deathrite shaman, and they're all great. They're definitely topics for future episodes, and I think we'll, I think we'll get to them. But let's start with a card that has caused many players headaches uh, ever since Legacy was in its infancy. The card in question, Aether Vial. Today's guest is uh, focused and, and driven to understand his deck uh, as any devout legacy player should be. His weapon of choice, Death and Taxes. Uh, he's taken the little white control deck to the top tables of a plethora of IQs and uh, at the uh, Star City Games headquarters in Roanoke, playing against some of the best legacy players pro probably in the world. Um, his dedication to the deck is strong, uh, and he's created a website solely dedicated to it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming today's guest, Philip Gallagher. Phil, welcome to Legacies Allure. Glad to be here. I am always happy to be either playing Legacy or talking about Legacy. So, an educational podcast, I'm a teacher, this is right up my alley. Let's, All right. Uh, let's talk about some mono-white control. <laughs> and while we're on the topic of uh, educating people about mono white control or death and taxes, you actually have a, a website dedicated to the deck, the archetype uh, uh, entirely, um, and I, I, it's called uh, thrabenuniversity.com. So why don't you take a second uh, before we dig into our topic about Aether Vial here and tell us what is the website, what's it about, what's it for, and, and who would you recommend it to? All right. So as I read MTG Salvation and the source posts over the last few years, I realized that newer Death and Taxes players always offered the same questions. They always wondered, why is Flicker Wisp in the deck? Why is this card in my sideboard? How am I supposed to play this matchup? And after answering the same questions, you know, maybe literally hundreds of times, I realized that there needed to be some sort of resource or database to help teach people these things. And so I put together Thraben University as sort of the authoritative source for death and taxes, you know, sort of modeling it over the, uh, the similar site, site for tests that Brian Cook put together. And so it has everything from matchup data to how to sideboard for matchups, although I'm not going to give you a straight guide for how to do that because, you know, sideboards are changing all the time. And I've got even down to the the sort of rulings level. I'm a level two judge myself, so a lot of times I'll post articles about how does Thalia actually work? How do you actually go about casting a spell? How does Rest in Peace interact with removal spells? And it's just meant to be sort of an educational repository for people who are learning the deck, or just a place where you can go and see someone else's opinion or various deck lists about death and taxes. All right. Well, that's pretty awesome. So the website again is thravenuniversity.com, and that should be in the comment or sorry, not in the comments, the description section of the YouTube video, and we'll try and get it uh, linked to the webcast as or yeah, the webcast as well. Um, so that's for all you Death and Taxes players, and for anybody who wants to know more about the deck, even if you're just playing against it, uh, check out that website. Uh, Phil's put a lot of work into it. I've been there a couple times, and it's it's really great. So awesome. Thank you very much for that, Phil. Uh, it's been a very rewarding experience, although I've had to kind of teach myself some basics of web design. Eh. That was not in my wheelhouse originally, but we're getting there. Awesome. All right, so today's topic, and and for the for the listeners who, who uh, first of all, I want to apologize. It has been a while since we've done an episode, so I am back, and I'm sure some of you noticed I got a haircut, or if you're just listening to this on audio, um, you can hear that I got a haircut. And I'm still the same Zach. It's just it's been a while since we've done an episode, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but but we're back. Um, anyway, so this new this new episode style that I'm I'm wanting to try out is focusing on a single card. And like I, I uh, mentioned earlier, we're talking about Aether Vial. 
Um, so, Phil, why don't you kick things off? Because Aether Vial is probably the linchpin uh, card that, that allows a deck like Death and Taxes to even exist. Um, why don't you tell us, like, what is the card? It's CMC. How does it work? Just everything about it uh, mechanically. All right. So Aether Vial was originally printed in Dark Steel, a very artifact-heavy and artifact-themed <laughs> matter block. It's been reprinted a couple of times, but mostly in sort of the side sets, like From the Vault Relics, and it was recently redone as a Kaladesh invention, and I think also in one of the Modern Master sets. Mm -hmm. Now, it has a converted mana cost of one, so it comes down on turn one. It's not going to do anything that first turn, 99% of the time. But at the beginning of your upkeep, it has a trigger, and you may put a charge counter on Aether Vial. Then Aether Vial has an activated ability that allows you to tap it to put a creature card onto the battlefield with the same converted mana cost as the number of charge counters on Aether Vial. So notice that that is exactly the same mana cost, not that amount or lower. Yeah, and that's a pretty common... Uh... Or, I'm sorry, that is an uncommon wording. Normally, cards will specify something like equal to or greater than, or they'll say a uh, converted mana cost of X or less. Um, and then those are the kind of things, like like with some of the counter spells or those kind of things um, that players come to expect, you, you know, that, that sort of pattern recognition. But Aether Vial sort of breaks that mold by being only equal to the mana cost um, of, the, of the creature in question. And... That's that's actually very relevant, and we'll probably get to that topic later, or that uh, sub discussion later. That the being required to put a creature of equal mana cost is is a hindrance for the player using the card, and it's actually a benefit for your opponents um, for, as far as figuring out like what creatures might might be put in and and, and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, to a certain degree, what can come in is telegraphed if right. your opponent knows your deck. Right, and that's that's one of the benefits of. Uh, of for the opponent playing against death and taxes is that the lists have been at least until recently relatively static the the creatures you can expect to see out of the deck are are pretty much uh consistent and uh optimized although we've had some some recent re or recent uh cards in the what was that conspiracy 2 that have sort of yeah, shaken I things up a little um, that could be a whole nother podcast what is the optimal configuration for death and taxes right now yeah. Let me tell you, I have a lot of forum regulars arguing that one to death. It's well, uh, that's for a different day. And I mean, that's great though, because that that means that the deck uh, is is in flux, and and there's there's innovation and, and change happening. And you know, a lot of accusations are that uh, Legacy gets a little stale, and a card like like uh, Recruiter of the Guard, I believe it is, and Sanctum Prelate, both of those have really shaken up um, at least the Death and Taxes forums. That that you know, people are now looking for 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 different uh, deck configurations and things like that. And, and anyway. also got Thalia Heretic Cathar. That's right. For that. And Eld that barely got the chance to shine before the new cards came in. Right. So anyway, back to Aether Vial. Let's, let's talk about some of... So you, you've discussed all the uh, the mechanics and, and sort of the, the card text, but there's a lot more lying underneath all that text as far as uh, the way the card plays in a game and and sort of the, uh, the nuance to it. So... Let's let's start, um, and we'll just run through a list of, of like sort of the things that make the card unique and the things you got to know about it um, in order to either play with it or play against it effectively. Uh, the first of which, and this is this is really big in my opinion, is that Aether Vial puts the creature onto the battlefield. It doesn't cast it. It doesn't play it. It doesn't. None of those old. It it literally just takes it from your hand to the battlefield, and and that's that's what happens like there is no there's no uh, on the stack time really so so effectively the creatures are uncounterable so why don't you talk about a why that's important and b how that sometimes plays out um non-intuitively especially to players who haven't played with or against the deck before so when most people think of the it can't be countered part they immediately jump to the miracles deck where the counterbalance and sensei's divining top lock often can keep many sort of fairish decks out of the game, or even shut down a combo deck entirely. Mm -hmm. Well, if Death and Taxes has an Aether Vial in play, the pilot can continue to dump creatures in all game, and the Force of Wills, the hard counter spells, and even the counterbalance aren't going to do anything about that. So it is a way to push creatures through really weird scenarios. 
if your opponent has something like a standstill, guess what? You're not casting those cards. They're just going right onto the battlefield. So no. it can create a lot of really strange scenarios and allow you to dodge some of your opponent's effects. Right, and actually, uh, mentioning Standstill, that's a deck that doesn't see much play anymore, but um, if, it, if it did, it would be very important to know that because Standstill uh, triggers no matter, no matter... Like, there's no way to stop that. So, so being able to get creatures around that would be a big deal. And if Standstill uh, ever makes a comeback, which, who knows, you know, Legacy's... I won't say it's cyclical, but it, it's definitely... Um, metagame shifting that there may come a day when standstill the the deck like the land still variant is, is popular once again and a, and a card like aether vial is is tremendous in those situations so or even better some versions of merfolk style decks in the past have even played standstill alongside aether vial mm -hmm. turn one aether vial turn two standstill i don't have to cast anything it's your move please let me draw three cards yeah, and that 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 bonus three cards is is really awesome when you can still continue to deploy your creatures around it, and you know, and pressure your opponent's life total. That's that's huge. Um, so the next topic, um, we we mentioned this earlier that the the converted mana cost that you can put into play with Aether Vial has to be equal to the number of charge counters on it, um, not equal to or less than. So it's worth noting here that the upkeep trigger to put a counter onto the vial it's not mandatory. So you can actually keep the vial at two charge counters or one or or most commonly I would say is, is probably three um, because th that's probably the highest density of, of converted mana costs in the Death and Taxes deck, at least of the really high impact creatures. So um, I guess there's not much more to say, but but it's, it's worth noting the, the upkeep trigger is not mandatory, so you can keep it wherever you want uh, on two or three typically. Um, and, and that allows you to to build your deck or to utilize your deck in such a way that that um, you can, like like with the new Recruit of the Guard, you can chain creatures like one CMC3 into the other, or, or if you have multiple CMC2 creatures in your hand, you can keep it the vial there and, and wait to deploy your creatures. Yeah, and that waiting is sometimes really important. Following up on our last note, since that Aether Vial in, in, uh, activation, once it resolves, the creature is instantly put on the battlefield, with creatures like, say, Phyrexian Revoker, there is no opportunity between that Aether Vial activation resolving and that ability happening. Mm -hmm. So your opponent does something like, I'll oh, cast Liliana of the Veil. I will vial in Phyrexian Revoker naming Liliana of the Veil. Oh, and now your opponent is is very, very sad. Yeah, that's actually a really good point that, I, that I'd forgotten, is that... Um... Aether Vial, in addition to making your creatures uncounterable, also makes gives them flash effectively, right? Oh yeah. So let, let's 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 just hit that now while we're on the topic. What? Why did? Why is giving all your creatures flash such a big a big boon? And I'll give you the next ten minutes if you need to talk about that. <laughs> oh man. So thinking about traditional control decks, like the draw go control decks, all you want to do is hit land drops and wait for your opponent to do something and act with the absolute maximum amount of information. Mm -hmm. That's what Aether Vial lets a creature deck do. And that's really dumb. The ability to play around sorcery, spe sorcery speed removal like Liliana of the Veil, Supreme Verdict, and Maelstrom Pulse, it, okay, that's kinda cool. The ability to respond to your opponent's spells by shutting them off with things like Phyrexian Revoker mm -hmm. is crazy. The ability to wait to see what your opponent is going to flip to their Delver and then make a decision about what creature to put in, this sort of stuff really warps the traditional roles that a creature deck has. And then we can get to our good buddy Flicker Wisp. Yeah, let's let's hit on Flicker Wisp. That that creature's phenomenal, and no nobody realizes it until until it destroys them. Flicker Wisp is what I think is the worst best card ever. Everyone looks at this card and they're like, "Why is this seeing legacy play?" It's a three one flyer that blinks something. But when that is allowed to happen at instant speed. A lot of really dumb things can happen, and sometimes it's really simple, like saving a creature from a removal spell. Mm -hmm. I'll abrupt decay your stoneforge. Oh, nope, I'll flicker wisp it out. It comes back at the end step, and I get another piece of value equipment. That's a really great two-for-one, or even better sometimes. Mm -hmm. But even cooler, 
is what you can do with that creature. Since Flicker with Trigger says it's going to return at the beginning of the next end step, if you get to do that at your end step, you blink out one of your opponent's cards for their entire turn. So you can use that to stop one of their creatures for attacking, from attacking. Or you can use it to, say, reset their Jace the Mind Sculptor and make it so they can't activate it during their turn. And this isn't even getting to the really weird stuff it can do, like, I'll flicker whip wisp my flicker wisp. Okay, at my end step, I'll flicker whip my flicker wisp my flicker wisp. At your end step, I'll flicker wisp out one of your cards for my turn. Right. And when you throw Recruiter of the Guard in there, and it can just get all sorts of derpy. Yeah, so so that's so so the the interaction for anybody who doesn't quite understand what's going on is uh, Flicker Wisp does state that when it enters the battlefield, you exile a permanent. It can be any permanent, both uh, both yours or your opponent's. Um, and then at the at the next end of turn step, or at the beginning of the next end of turn step, the the card that was exiled will return to the battlefield. Um, but you actually get priority during your end step. And and the reason that's important is because with Aether Vial, you can then activate Aether Vial. If it has three counters, you can put a Flicker Wisp onto the battlefield and it will, and it's uh, enter the battlefield trigger of Exile and Card will trigger. But you're already in the end step. So there won't be another beginning of end step until the next turn. So if say you put a Flicker Wisp into, onto the battlefield during your own end step, during that phase after the beginning of end step has already occurred, the the permanent that you exile with Flicker Wisp will not return until the next turn. So your opponent's end step, or vice versa, you can put a permanent on. Uh, in, you can put the Flicker Wisp in on your opponent's end step, and then the permanent won't return until your own. So say you wanted to get rid of a blocker, or you wanted to. Uh, uh, probably a better example is you want to take away your opponent's. Um, what's the land and lands? Yeah. Maybe. And Staring Bridge, sure. Uh, all of those, though, can you know you could do it on your own turn, and it wouldn't be a whole lot different. The, the what's the the legendary land? Uh, pen, uh, tabernacle. The Tabernacle at Pendril Vale puts an upkeep trigger on your creature. So on your opponent's end step, you can uh, exile it. It won't it won't return until their turn or until the end of your turn. Sorry. So on your upkeep, when you would have to pay the upkeep cost for all of your creatures or have them destroyed, the the Tabernacle's not on the battlefield it's in exile so it doesn't it doesn't trigger and then your mana is free to do things like well if you're playing against lands you probably want rest in peace or to to play some wastelands or you know use your wastelands or something like that and that's that's a very um corner case that is uh extremely useful and and, and i mean there's a whole host of them like you mentioned with jace the mind sculptor being able to reset them and not let them use them and, and all sorts of stuff like that um but but you don't you don't see that or you don't. A lot of players don't experience that until until it's it's destroying them. Usually, it's 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 creating so much card advantage and so much uh, tempo advantage that they just they just uh, fall behind because of it. And and uh, and it's good to hear about it now. At least have it explained a little more because even even the first time it happens, you may not completely understand what what went on. Um, I, I'm sure there's a ton of judge calls about how that works. Oh, I. More judge calls have happened about Flicker Wisp than any other card in the deck, including Thalia. So, now Thalia is is another very interesting one that um, normally uh, you would think, well, I play Thalia be, uh, as soon as I can. Like if if I have two mana, I just put a Thalia out there um, because my opponent will have to either respond with whatever instance they want to play because you know Thalia makes a, an in all non creature spells cost one more, or um, when we get to their turn, I would already want it to be in play. Like, there's no reason to, th to use Aether Vial, right? But there are some corner cases where Vialing in Athalia can be incredibly powerful. Um, Phil, I'm sure you've done this. I, I haven't had the, the pleasure of doing it yet. I played Death and Taxes a little bit, but, but I'm not enough. So why don't you tell us, what are some scenarios where keeping your Vial on two and being able to flash, effectively, air quotes, flash in Athalia is is you know really powerful and, and why does that make aether vial so great i i think the most famous one happened in the the top eight of uh, i think it was a legacy open mark koenig was playing against miracles mm -hmm. his opponent leaves up one mana after using his sensei's divining top and passes the turn mm -hmm. mark has a vial on two and a thalia in hand and he doesn't put it in he instead goes to his turn and goes to attack his opponent draws a card with top, revealing a Terminus, and Mark vials in Athalia. Now if his opponent wants to cast that, he has to pay two, but he only has a single mana. 
So he effectively sort of countered a Terminus and got it stuck in his opponent's hand by waiting to put that Thalia in play. Yep, and actually that was uh, one of the SCG sort of like best of moments. And and actually when we had Mark Koenig on the on the previous podcast about about death and taxes, I, I mentioned or we mentioned that because that was that was a a very uh, game pivotal moment uh, in that in that specific game. And that's the kind of thing that again, if you don't know how Aether Vial works and sort of the very very nuanced interactions with those cards, you probably wouldn't see it coming. And and it uh, he was playing against Joe Lissette and Joe got totally wrecked by it and it basically lost him the entire game. So that's like you said, a very corner case um, where where that would happen. Now another one that that I've personally witnessed is um, a player cast a shardless agent yes and with the shardless agents cast because uh shardless agents cascade ability is a trigger so while the while the shardless agent is on the stack the trigger goes on the stack then to to reveal cards and then cast it you know how that works and the opponent vialed in a thalia in response and then um the cascade trigger resolves and uh they cascaded into an abrupt decay but there was no spare mana to pay for the Abrupt Decay, because the Abrupt Decay now costs zero from Cascade plus one from Thalia's uh, taxing effect, and the Abrupt Decay was uncastable. Now, that could have backfired if he had hit a Deathrite Shaman or Tarmogoyf or something, but it, I, I feel like that's that's the kind of scenario where you can really get him if, if you know what you're doing and you're working around it, and and he was indeed not ready for that exact scenario, and you know the event uh, after the Cascade Trigger resolved, he was forced to just put the Abrupt Decay on the bottom of his library. You can't cast it. Uh, just while we're here, because this is one of my favorite little rulings, Mm-hmm. Note that with a Cascade Trigger and a Thalia, you can only activate mana abilities between that Cascade Trigger starting and it resolving. Oh, right. Death Rate Shaman is yeah. not a mana ability, so your opponent cannot use a Death Rate Shaman activation to pay for the Thalia tax. And that's actually a pretty uh, corner corner case situation as well that, once again, is probably only going to come up in something like Death and Taxes, uh, and, and it's worth knowing. Um, now that one doesn't specifically involve Aether Vial, but it does involve the deck in general. And 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 well, while we're on the topic of Aether Vial, um, Death and Taxes is certainly the deck most known for it. I would say it's it's the most heavily played deck anyway. Um, but there are some other some other decks that run Aether Vial, sort of for similar reasons that Death and Taxes does. So let's subject hop here, and um, we'll talk about the uh, the so I'll call it the virtual mana, like Aether Vial. It doesn't make mana because it doesn't actually cast spells or anything like that, and you and you can only do creatures. But it it really is kind of um, making mana, um, and and that's really important to all the decks that use it, death and taxes included. Um, but Phil, why don't you tell us why is this sort of virtual mana really important? Like, what are what are some of the benefits you can get from it, and and how does that play out in the different vile decks? Okay. So when we're talking about actual mana, we're referring to things produced by lands or perhaps by your spells. So a lot of times decks will try to cheat on mana. Um, an ad nauseum deck, for example, might use a dark ritual to net two mana. Or the Eldrazi decks are using the so-called soul lands, like mm -hmm. Ancient Tomb and City of Traders, to produce extra mana. Casting your spells ahead of time is very, very useful. But Aether Isle doesn't produce mana but it allows you to cheat on mana in a similar sort of way. When you take an Aether Vial up to one, and you can tap it and put in a Mother of Runes, well, you have virtually gotten one extra mana out of that. The next turn, you can tap it for two, maybe put in a Thalia. Now you've gotten three virtual mana out of that card. And as the game goes on and on and on and on, you may find yourselves cheating 10 or maybe even 15 mana over the course of a game for your one mana investment. And this frees up the rest of your lands to do things like Wasteland your opponent, or Rashadenport, or dump out your hand even quicker. This is virtual mana, and it can provide you with a very significant tempo boost. Yeah, so that sort of is the name of the game with Aether Vial. It's either um, utility lands uh, or tempo, or, or, or both actually. Um, in the case of something like Goblins, which is a deck that, that ran Aether Vial, um, and it also used Wasteland and Rashadenport, it, it was sort of doing double duty. It could, it could either increase the number of spells you cast in a turn, or it could um, allow you to cast spells and disrupt the, your opponent's mana. 
Um, and that's that's really the big the biggest benefit I would say uh, for most decks with Aether Vial is that it it gives you extra virtual mana, so you can you can cast spells and then you, or sorry you can cast creature spells and then do other things, whether it be cast um, instants of sorceries, artifacts, enchantments, or um, disrupt your opponent uh, in in some way or another. Um, now another another uh, big thing that that I I think uh, is important with Aether Vial, and this is probably more common in decks like uh, Merfolk, but but even in Death and Taxes this can be a big deal, is that Aether Vial, because it's a pseudo mana source, uh, does allow you to, to cheat on the number of lands that you play and the number of lands that you keep in an opening draw. You know, Legacy is is sort of uh, founded on this, you can keep one lander's mentality where like, oh, well, my ponders or some, something in the format is going to allow you to fix the fact or, or, or cheat around the fact that you only have a one land hand, which in any other format is sort of a, a death sentence. Um, and Aether Vial does exactly that, right? So... Why don't you talk a little bit about um, a deck that doesn't have any card manipulation, really, and how Aether Vial fixes its otherwise bad hands. Sure. If you take any random blue sort of mid-range or aggro deck, or even combo deck of the format, anything ranging from Infect to Delver to an Omniscience deck, those decks are full of Gitaxian probes, Preordains, Ponders, Brainstorms. And so if you have one land and a couple of cantrips, you're fine. You will be able to find that next land without any issues. Death and Taxes runs almost no manipulation. There's Stoneforge Mystic. Well, that can find you equipment. And there's Recruiter of the Guard. That can find you creatures. But you don't get anything to help you find your land drops. So whatever is in your opener, you are stuck with that. You don't get sort of the, uh, the do-agains that cantrips provide you. Aether Vial can turn a one lander from an instant mulligan to a snap keep. And now one landers are always a little dicey, no matter what deck it is. But a one land ether vial hand has the potential to, you know, curve a mom into a couple of Sarah Avengers into a flicker wisp and just completely wreck your opponent very, very quickly. And they don't have many opportunities to counter your cards that matter. Exactly. And, 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 it also I've noticed um, because Aether Vial is is a card that's very likely to draw out counter spells. You can play these mind games too, where like say you have a two Aether Vial hand, um, and you do the one where you play a land, you play the Aether Vial, and if your opponent has like a Daze or a Force of Will, they they are almost compelled to try, and. If you go to your next turn, you can bait them right into that same line by instead of playing a land, just play your second Aether Vial before, like say you have a two or three land hand, just play your second Aether Vial before you have the mana. See if they'll bite again, because again, getting getting an Aether Vial down makes all of your future counter spells pretty worthless against a deck like Goblins or Death and Taxes, because all the creatures become uncounterable then, like we mentioned earlier. And if they don't know whether you kept a land light hand or not, you can really play some mind games uh, in a situation where otherwise you, you know you wouldn't have a lot of flexibility. And uh, and like I said, b because or like we mentioned, because Aether Vial lets you keep light land light hands, you can you can actually turn turn that into an advantage and uh, and try and get your opponent with it. Yeah, the multiple Aether Vial hands are sometimes really weird, and sometimes you might try to bait your opponent into countering both. Like, yeah. get those counter spells out of there. Okay, I'll just play my Thalia on turn three instead, and then wasteland you in the same turn. You've spent most of your resources answering the vials, and now I just have the fistful of gas that's left. Exactly. And if they let it, and if they let it resolve, or they don't have the counter spells, or even if they do have the counter spells and they let it resolve, their counter spells don't matter anymore because they can't stop your creatures anyhow. So it's sort of a damned if you do or if you don't situation. Yeah, the newer blue players, after I play matches with them, the, the, the phrase I hear the most is, gosh, I really should have countered that ether vial, shouldn't I? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah. So um, while we're still talking about uh, mana and tempo advantage through aether vial, there's, there's one other um, point I'd like to make, and this is n not so common in Death and Taxes, although it's going to be more common with Recruiter of the Guard, but it was really, really notable in uh, Goblins, is um, you can make tremendous advantage on your on the uh, like effective mana spent which i realize that's that's sort of a nebulous idea mana spent how, you know how does that equate to like 
uh, your performance in a game or how much winning you're doing. But in a deck like Goblins, the more mana you spend, the better you're doing. And with Aether Vial, because you can, you, uh, in a deck like Goblins, you can take it all the way up to four and start casting five. your, your even game. five, yeah. Siege Gang. You can really uh, uh, make some haymakers with, with Aether Vial. So, uh, and then the specific scenario is something like you have a vial on three, so at your opponent's end step, you activate it, put out Goblin Matron, go find Goblin Ringleader. Goblin Ringleader, on your next turn, you take your vial up to four, put the Ringleader onto the battlefield either with the vial or with four mana, maybe like a Cavern of Souls or something like that. And with the cards you find, you can then use the vial or your spare mana, either one, to put even more guys out. So, so instead of just getting up to, to like three mana cheats like Death and Taxes does, you can get up to four mana cheats or even five. And that makes every one of your lands plus the Aether Vial, it's, it's almost like you have nine or ten mana in a turn. And in, in some formats like Standard, nine or ten mana, like that's a lot, but it's not like unheard of. But in Legacy, getting to ten mana especially as early as turn four or five is, is just incredible. Like you're on par with decks like Storm at that point, right? Like the only other decks that can generate 10 mana by turn four that quickly are doing really broken things. And a deck like Goblins, like at the, you know, on the surface just looks like a bunch of creatures. And Aether Vial really, um, again, allows them to just cheat like crazy on their mana and do all sorts of, you know, really broken things. And it's kind of it's kind of neat how that works. Have you have you had experience? I know you played it in taxes, but have you had experience um, like playing against goblins or, or with the deck where where, they, where you get that sort of like four mana chains into each other? Because it it's mind boggling sometimes how many creatures just show up out of nowhere. E E three. <laughs> I played against goblins in round three or four, and my opponent was hellbent. He just drew a card for his turn and cast a ringleader. He then hit three cards off of it, dropped a lackey onto the battlefield, used his vial on three to vial in, uh, what is it? Is it Goblin King that gives haste? No, uh, no, no the uh, Chieftain gives haste, I think. Yeah, Goblin Chieftain. Vials in Goblin Chieftain and then attacks me with three creatures out of nowhere. Yeah, and he could probably uh, lackey in. If he hits you, the lackey puts the other one in. Wow, it's like it's like he, he Ancestral Recalled. Plus, plus played a whole bunch of tutus. Yeah. And, like, against death and taxes, just an army of idiots can sometimes be surprisingly scary. Like, just a whole bunch of creatures coming out of nowhere. If you don't have equipment and you just have a couple of recruiters and moms on the battlefield, it can add up. Yeah, certainly. So, um, did, watch out for that. Like, it, Goblins isn't a deck you see a ton of anymore. I know we had an episode about it and we sort of talked about some of the nuance. But just like death and taxes, Aether Vile is the card that's like making that deck work and the and the the possibilities of things you can do with it are just just phenomenal it's it's totally awesome how that works um while, while we're still sort of talking about goblins and aether vial tricks and whatnot mm -hmm. um one thing to keep in mind is that aether vial is a trigger so your triggers can be responded to oh yes so, yes yeah with your aether vial trigger on the stack you can vial in a creature so let's say you had an opening hand with two Mother of Runes and a whole bunch of three drops. On your second turn there, you can vial in a Mother of Runes on one and then put the counter for two onto it. So you end up with a tapped vial at two. And then on your next turn, you can tick it up to three and start just dumping in your three drops. So you can kind of jump a step, so to speak, if you know how your priority works. Right. So, so this uh, for anybody who missed that interaction that Phil was describing. So, what happens is is the aether vial will trigger at the beginning of your upkeep to to, to optionally put another counter on it or not, another uh, charge counter or not, and you might want to put the counter on because you want to, like he said, you have a handful of three drops and you want to work up to that three, but you have a second one drop or maybe you have a second two drop. You know, you're in a scenario where you have like more than one two drop and you want them all to be uncounterable. So with the activation or with the, uh, sorry, the non-mandatory upkeep trigger to put a charge counter on, on the upkeep, you can hold priority there and activate the, the second Aether ability, or I'm sorry, the, the activated ability of Aether Vial and put a creature with the current number of charge counters on it onto the battlefield. So if you, if you had a Mother of Runes and your Vial had one counter, but there was a trigger waiting to resolve, you can activate it, put the second Mother, and then let it go up to two counters, which, like I said, I realized I just rehashed what he, exactly what he said, but I'm trying to spell it out a little more clearly um, for anybody who doesn't quite understand how Aether Vial works. And I promise you, 
If you have never played against Aether Vile, if you're new to Legacy, you won't understand everything even after listening to this podcast. I'm sorry. It's going to get you. Um, but but hopefully you're learning something here and, and you don't get, get gotten quite as bad. Because it is, it is a nightmare of a card to play against. The, the combination of instant speed, counter spell, or uh, uncounterable, and uh, and all these like ridiculous interactions is, is just too much to to comprehend sometimes. <laughs> yeah, when you're when you're used to your creature based opponents just playing at sorcery speed, even something as simple as just throwing in a two one first striker in the middle of combat can be absolutely devastating. It's true. Not to mention all of the other potential tricks that flicker wisps and stone forges and revokers can do. So while we're on uh, the topic of, of other tricks, now we talked about uh, instant speed for Exian Roker being able to shut off a permanent while it's waiting to resolve. The, the most notable there is, is probably Planeswalkers, but there's a couple others, artifacts and those kind of things that uh, Re- Phyrexian Revoker can stop while your opponent's waiting for them to, to, to be finished casting. Um, but there's actually a couple other like really awesome ones, uh, creatures that, that some, they're, they're not quite as common every time or, or they're not, they're not, uh, stock I'll say in the death and taxes list, um, that, that also interact very well with Aether Vile. Um, the, probably the most notable is Sarah Avenger. Uh, but Phil, why don't you hit on a few of these other creatures that because of the way Aether Vile, uh, works and, and being able to put the creatures either in at instant speed or, uh, ahead of the curve, if you will. Um, why that's such an advantage to having to having a card like Aether Vial. All right, so Aether Vial lets you cheat mana, but it also lets you cheat certain casting restrictions. So there are some cards like Sarah Avenger that have some downside that make it hard to cast because they're at such an aggressively mana-costed rate. So Sarah Avenger is a 3-3 Flying Vigilance for White White. Now, that's pretty absurd. People are playing one blue for their Delvers, and they have to work to turn those into just a 3-2 flyer. Right. But you can't cast Sarah Avenger during your first, second, or third two. Third turn. But as we've already established, Aether Vial is not casting. So with an Aether Vial on two, you can put that Sarah Avenger in earlier than you could regularly casting it. And as silly as it sounds, in a, a very aggressive 3-3 Flying Vigilance can both be attacking and defending against smaller creatures, and it can be quite a headache. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, the number of times that a, a Sarah Avenger... And Sarah Avenger is one of those cards that, like, it used to be really, really common in Death and Taxes. Now it's like, you see them sometimes, you see them sometimes you don't. Um, but, a, but like you mentioned, a 3-3 Flyer out of nowhere is a huge creature that like a lot of opponents aren't ready to deal with. So if you just, you just make that show up, especially when, when it's not supposed to, like in the first, uh, for, on turn three, um, that can be, that can be like a blowout in a lot of scenarios. I know my ink moths have run into them and it's, it's absolutely terrible. Like, you know, you have to blow a pump spell just to keep your guy alive or you just lose your land or whatever. Cause, cause three, three in, in legacy is actually a, a really big creature. I know in standard, that's sort of like, that is the standard, air quotes. Uh, but but three three and legacies is a, is a real monster. So Sarah there Avenger is, is sweet. There are so many two twos running around, like shardless agents and goblin guides. That filing in a Sarah Avenger means you've not only cheated mana and have a great creature in play, but you also probably ate something mid combat. Mm-hmm. Now um, a, a newer card that that I think gets a gets a huge bonus with. Um, with Aether Vial is uh, sanct- that new the uh, Sanctum Prelate, the the one from Conspiracy Two, the one that when it enters the battlefield, you choose a converted mana cost, and then non-creature spells of that converted mana cost cannot be cast. Like they just literally can't be cast. So I, I mean, I think the the biggest or the most important um, mana cost is six because because you can actually shut off Terminus with this. Right, with the uh, this oh, is yeah. this is kind of the same trick we talked about earlier, or along the same lines, where when your opponent uh, miracles a terminus and reveals it for the for the first draw of their turn, um, that card is actually in their hand and isn't being cast yet. There's there's a trigger on the stack waiting to resolve, and while that trigger is on the stack, you get priority. So if you vial in a prelate and then name six, which is the converted mana cost of miracle of the miracle terminus your opponent can't play it they're they're just stuck with it in their hand 
because they have already drawn it, but that but they're not allowed to cast it yet, and that that's pretty nifty, I think. Yeah, there are a lot of really weird, very complicated scenarios that often involve reshotting, porting your opponent down when they don't know the prelate is coming, and then you just vial it in and get them. It's like, oh, okay, you're not going to do anything in response to this. I've tapped your land. Now the prelate comes in, and he shuts off your one out that you were waiting for. Now, I can imagine another scenario or something similar to that where um, you your opponent reveals a card uh, to Delver of Secrets because they have to reveal the instant they have to reveal sorry the instant or sorcery um, that that they're they're using to flip the Delver and I don't know if you've had a scenario does the, I mean I know it works but is it is it actually any good have you tried uh, flashing in or aether violing in a prelate in response like with that trigger after it resolves on their upkeep so you so you can actually just shut off whatever spell it is that they that they revealed yes many times. Seems like Lightning Bolt would be a good one. <laughs> it's, it's not always just that either. Sometimes it's the uh, the sort of thing where your opponent has something like an Ancestral Visions on Suspend. Oh, there's and, a good one, yeah. Yeah, this one's devastating. Uh, Ancestral Visions actually has two triggers. One allows you to remove a counter from it. The second is when the final counter is removed, you have the option to go ahead and cast that. Well, you can go ahead and vial in Sanctum Prelate and set it to zero so that your opponent will not be able to go ahead and cast that nice nifty Ancestral Vision that they've been waiting so long to cast. And it just kind of hangs out in exile forever, being sad. Now, you you cannot uh, work this trick with a Cascade into Ancestral Visions, correct? Correct. Because just like before, when the Cascade trigger resolves, nothing happens between that trigger starting to resolve and it finishing resolving, except mana abilities being activated. All right, so actually, let's hammer that just a little bit more for anybody who doesn't quite understand. So um, the difference between the suspend uh, mechanic triggers where you take time counters off and cast an Ancestral Visions from Exile, which you may have seen in Modern or, or or in some of your Legacy games, versus cascading into it with a Shardless Agent is this. In in the first case, Ancestral Visions has two triggers. Like, he allude, like Phil alluded to, there's the trigger to remove a counter and then the trigger to cast. Now, you can respond to either one of those triggers because you actually get priority and you know that the, the Ancestral Vision is coming. You could put your Prelate into the battlefield and name zero. In the Cascade uh, example with Shardless Agent, the Cascade trigger will go onto the stack, and at that point, you could you could like you know roll the dice and guess that there's a Visions on top, put your pellet in and name zero, but you aren't sure of it. And once your opponent begins revealing cards for the Cascade trigger, you've passed priority, and there is no more response time. You have no uh, in response, or as a, as a fast effect, as we old timers used to say, you don't get to do something. Uh, while they're revealing cards or when they finally reveal the card that they will be casting so so don't try that trick if you're a DNT player or especially a newer one um, Sanctum prelate doesn't work like that. You can't you can't respond to it by And and actually that's probably the the, the most non-intuitive thing is a lot of people compared Sanctum prelate to chalice of the void But it is not like chalice of the void in that chalice of the void if, if, if it worked like chalice of the void Then this trick would work you could put it in response and then there'd be a trigger to counter it. But Sanctum Prelate is not a trigger. It is just a sort of a static effect that, that disallows casting spells of the certain mana cost. So you, it, you cannot respond to the Cascade um, res resolution. Yeah. And on that note, if you have questions about the differences between those two, on my website, there is a little <laughs> article, I think entitled, No, It's Not Chalice of the Void, or something of that nature. <laughs> So he, he plugs as shamelessly as I do for his own stuff. Oh, so yeah. no, it's the business, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody goes if you don't, if you don't tell them to. All right. So let's talk a little strategy with Aether Vile. And, and now we'll, we'll, we'll very uh, narrowly focus on death and taxes, although we sort of have been anyway. Um, strategically, when should you tick up your vial and when should you not? Like when, what are the scenarios where you want to and not, and don't want to? And we can even go into like which matchups is it probably more relevant to keep it at one or two or three, uh, or sorry, one or two versus going all the way up to three or whatever. So this is the, the question that I get asked a lot. <laughs> and the easy answer is it's all situational and it's hard to generalize. 
With that being said, I'm going to generalize. <laughs> Generally speaking, Aether Vial is allowing you to cheat mana. So you want to play in a way that optimizes your cheating of mana. A lot of times that means leaving it at two until you empty your hand of two drops and then ticking it up to three. But there are a lot of situations where some of the tricks you can do with the vial are more important than maximizing the mana usage. For example, in the Miracles matchup, it is very common to leave a vial at two for the entire game because Thalia, Guardian of Graven, Thraven, costs two. And it can be protected with Caracas, which allows you to return a legendary creature to its owner's hand. So if your opponent tries to Terminus or Swords to Plowshare your Thalia, you bounce it with Caracas, and then you vial it right back in, and ugh, your opponent has to try to deal with it again. Yeah, and 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 that's actually Miracles is probably the the best example. Um, all of hold on, let me let me make sure I'm not overgeneralizing. Almost all of the two mana creatures are probably the best creatures against Miracles. Uh, Phyrexian Revoker, Stoneforge Mystic, and Thalia, Guardian of Thraven, are, all three of them have really important effects against Miracles, and they aren't all great against other decks, but, they're all, but all three of those are really solid against Miracles. So leaving your Vial at two in that case is really important. And, not, and like you alluded to, the, or you mentioned the, the Thalia interaction, that's probably the, the most notable. Um, but the Revoker... Uh, being able to stop Jace the Mind Sculptor and Sensei's Divining Top is huge. And Stoneforge Mystic, this one's a little less intuitive, but being able to get either the equipment, or the, the swords, usually, usually Sword of Fire and Ice, or um, Batter Skull to sort of create these threats that absolutely must be answered it is, is way more useful than, say, ticking up to three and being able to play a Flicker Wisp trick for a turn or two. Yeah, um... Diving into the Miracles matchup just slightly, that is actually a game that is often decided by equipment, as weird as that sounds, because you can dump a Sword of Fire and Ice or a Sword of War and Peace in play, and then all of a sudden, every 1-1 one -one is a potential lethal threat that has to be answered. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to just have uncounterable equipment, both because you put in the Stoneforge off the vial, and then you vial in the equipment with Stoneforge, so mm -hmm. to speak, means that the counter spells or the counterbalance lock isn't doing anything about getting letting those get into play right yeah i think uh in, in specifically in the miracles matchup the, the absolute best strategy is to get a vial on one and, or, or a vial on two and on three it is a nightmare scenario for them <laughs> <laughs> everything can happen okay right. so uh continuing with the strat i'm sorry did i cut you off uh well I was going to hit on the pump fakes now because yeah. you're talking about oh, that, that is another huge Aether Vial strategy that um, I feel like if you're a newer player, it's totally lost on you, as most bluffs are. And if you're a veteran player, it has got to, it's like one of the most nerve-wracking. So, so what is the pump fake activation of an Aether Vial? So you can activate Aether Vial and not actually put anything in. You don't it even have to have something in your hand that you could legally put in. You can just activate an ether vial. So a lot of times I'll say, end of turn, activate ether vial on two. And I'll just look at my opponent waiting for a response. And they'll be like, hold on, I'm gonna brainstorm in response. Or I'm gonna stifle that activation. Yep. You can fish a surprising amount of cards out of your opponent's hand because of the fear. The fear that Thalia comes in. The fear that a revoker comes in and shuts off their top. So they might draw a card early. The fear that a Stoneforge is going to come in and, you know, a Jitte is going to hit play that you can't deal with. So yep. the pump fakes cause your opponent to think about things that may or may not actually be there. And they have to preemptively respond because once that vial activation happens, your creature is in play and there's nothing they can do about it. Yeah, and I think I think the uh, the stifle scenario is one of the one of the worst ones um, where your opponent is expending an entire card stifle to prevent the activation of of an ability the, the the aether vial and they don't even know what the possible outcome would have been it's not like stifling a fetch land where you know what you're stopping like you're stopping them from getting a mana you're kind of you're kind of wastelanding them but when you stifle an aether vial you might not actually be doing anything you, you could be stopping there you can buy tempo which is what stifle normally does buy some tempo 
but you might just be wasting a card for nothing. Because if they don't actually have that current event cost, they're not going to put anything out there, and then your stifle's gone. And I mean, I, 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 in a lot of ways, if you're playing a stifle deck, you're already feeling terrible against death and taxes. But this just makes it that much worse when you have to like play mind games with a guy who's playing uh, mono white creatures. Like, no, nothing can feel worse. I, I don't think. <laughs> oh, it, there is one thing that can feel worse. It's when you're running Spirit of the Labyrinth. In your <laughs> <laughs> so, for those of you not familiar with this gem. Uh, Spirit of the Labyrinth is only going to let your opponent draw one card a turn. Let me let me pull up the exact oracle text because I don't want to mix it up with something like Notion Thief here. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, your opponent can't draw more than uh, one card per turn. Each player can't draw more than one card each turn. Oh, it's both players. So it, it is symmetrical, meaning that if you have something like a Sword of Fire and Ice, you're not going to get to draw that card off it. Sure. Um, but in the uh, in the treasure cruise era, when everyone was drawing three cards, it, it was really common to run two or three spirit of the labyrinths in the deck. Sure. So every bile activation at two was a potential spirit of the labyrinth, which would just shut off brainstorms. So in that era, anytime I tapped a bile at two, people were like, "Ugh, brainstorm in response." And then a lot of times they're missing off the the value of fetching that away or saving the brainstorm for a little bit later when they had more information or useless cards to shuffle away. Sure. It, it's probably uh, worth noting that there are going to be scenarios, and I hate to keep coming back to miracles, but I mean it is public enemy number one. So there yeah. there are going to be scenarios where your opponent isn't trying to 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 get a a miracle activation. They're just trying to get an extra card because like they need another blue card for a force of will, or they. They, they needed to draw a land for their turn just to, to keep playing lands, but the Swords to Plowshares that they want is hiding on top of their deck. And if you set things up in such a way that they're sort of forced to activate that top, you could you could vial in the Spirit of the Labyrinth strategically there, and they will, they will activate their top, draw nothing, and then it goes on top of their library. So you, you kind of deny them an entire turn's worth of draw steps that way. Right. Uh, of note there, that's only if they have already drawn a card for turn, though. Right. Yeah. I'm saying this would have to be on their turn, not on yours. Yeah. And and these are these are corner case scenarios, but that's that's what we're talking about. Like when you're gonna dig into a single card, like Aether Vial, we're gonna talk about every bizarre scenario or most bizarre scenarios that you can come up with. Um, and like like the pump kit fake one, like we just mentioned, that's kind of a bizarre scenario to come into. Um, good players, good death and Dex players will do it. Um, but but it, it's non intuitive for sure. Um. Another sort of, in my opinion, non-intuitive uh, strategically uh, point with Aether Vial is, is knowing when to use it. Because there are certainly times when I've been playing the deck where I've got a three drop in hand. Say I've got um, a Maran Crusader or something like Like I've got this creature that I could deploy, but say I've, I, maybe I've already got um, Thalia and a, a Phyrexian Roker on the table. And I'm worried about something like a Terminus or I'm worried about something like a Toxic Deluge. And I don't necessarily want to put another creature onto the battlefield. Like, does the extra, does the extra creature um, actually gain you that much value? So there's some strategy into getting the most out of your activations. And I've only, you know, I use the Moran Crusader of example, but I'm sure there's way better ones. Most of them involving Flicker Wisp. Uh, yeah. So Phil, why don't, why don't you enlighten us? What are some of the other, what are some of the strategic ways to get the most out of your Aether Vial activations? Because it's worth noting, you only get to activate it once per turn. It does tap. It's not like you can just fire this thing off repeatedly. So go ahead. Um, one of my favorites involves Flicker Wisp. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and that is the good old, let's reset my Aether Vial. So this usually happens during your opponent's second main phase. After they say, pass the turn, you say, hold on. During your second main phase, I'll activate Ether Vial. You put in your Flicker Wisp and target your Ether Vial. At their end step, it comes back. And then at your upkeep, you start ticking it up over again and again and again. So, for example, in a matchup where your opponent has counter spells, you can just reset that vial and not be afraid to tick it up to three because there, are, there aren't consequences. You can reset it with Flicker Wisp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the big thing there is is it's really common to go, like, y you'll leave it at one for one turn, because Mother Runes is pretty much the only one mana creature that uh, Death and Taxes plays anymore. So you'll want to move it up to two, but if you draw Mother of Runes in subsequent turns, you she's she's 
good in some games and great in others and you'd like her to resolve so so there it's nice if there's a way to go back down to one and like what you just alluded to is a way to reset your vial and effectively make mother of runes uncounterable again a lot of aether vial use is really just mental warfare and a lot of times it is just straight bluffing all right i am dead on board i am going to tick this vial up and represent a threat and if my opponent attacks into it, they are going to lose the game. Um, this happens a lot against decks like Delver and Infect, where, all right, they got a fast start, you're on the back foot. But then, like, during your turn, you just absolutely just quickly slam it up to three, draw your card, pass the turn, represent strength. And all of a sudden, your opponent goes, they didn't concede. Yep. They yep. must have something. What, what do I need to play around here? And sometimes this may give you that extra turn you need to actually draw something that's relevant. Or maybe, yeah, or maybe you just, like, you need to activate to put in the recruiter of the guard to go get the thing that actually does the trick you want, but you don't, you know, you can't, you can't fate, or you can't represent it if you, if you don't try, so. So, like, in playing against lands, for example, my opponent just, like, had an exploration start and was ready to make a merit lodge on, on about turn three or four. So... I just take my vial up to three, and I'm like, pass the turn. I'll attack. And I just I kept attacking with two twos into his potential merit lodge, and he just did not make the merit lodge because he was terrified of the flicker wisp because I just hadn't tapped that vial. I was just leaving it at three, waiting. Right. And so I had probably about six turns that I did not deserve. I was just dead. But I represented strength with either vial. I represented tricks and it wins you games well yeah and and i know exactly how that works because playing in fact it's it's sort of the same line you, you're you're representing the unknown right like you're, you're playing on the fact that your opponent suspects or is afraid of something that may or may not be there and like you said a lot of times what you have to represent is a catastrophic scenario like if i do my thing and he has it i just straight up lose so maybe i'll maybe i'll just bide my time and wait and i can i can get into an unlosable scenario and sometimes that's all it takes. You gotta, you gotta sort of grasp that little bit of advantage you can get there, and then, um, and then by the time you do draw the thing that actually gets them, you know, then then your bluff uh, worked. You know, not now it's now it's the real thing. It's not just the bluff. But oh man, he really did have it. Of course, you all they always have it. They always have it. Um, well, if you let them draw it, they sure do. Yes. <laughs> um, another favorite of my tricks is what what I call the plant where I know that I have either won the game 100% sure on my turn, or I know that I have 100% lost the game, I will take a vial up to four. Ooh. Now, there are no four drops in my deck the vast majority of the time. However, you know what happens when you take a vial up to four when playing D&T? Your opponent goes, oh my god, what do they have? Do what? they have Restoration Angel? What's it Is for? Restoration Angel in their deck? And then they start playing around cards that don't actually exist in your deck. That's yeah. a really fun one. Because if because say you're in this and then and that's a that's a good that's a good strategic comment again. Because like let's say you're you're playing against a deck like Shardless uh, um, Shardless Sultai, where they expect you to bring in something like a Wiltleaf Leech, and you may not even have it in your deck, your sideboard, or or most importantly, you may not even have it in your hand, but the, the fear of it coming can sometimes be enough to make your opponent play incorrectly or or suboptimally uh, at, at a minimum. And and like you said, maybe that can be enough to, to, to turn a game around or to give you an edge to to turn an unwinnable situation into a, you know, a five percenter. Yep. Um, another thing you can do is very conspicuously announce a vile trigger to see if your opponent will respond. <laughs> this is one of my favorites for like when I'm pretty sure my opponent has a stifle and I'll just like point to my vial and like vile trigger and they'll look at me and they're like, why does this matter? Oh wait, he has a three drop in hand. He wants me to like stifle. Oh, he's waiting to see if I have stifle? I guess I can stifle this? This is weird. And, and sometimes you bait out a reaction just by doing that. Yeah, or it could be something else too. Just even if or, even if all they have is like um, a disenchant effect or an abrupt decay, and you're trying to bait them into destroying the vial instead of the creature you want to cast by announcing the trigger, you could be like forcing them to act so that you don't get your free mana and, and your activation out of it. This is most common with a vial going from two to three, 
when you're like vile trigger and they're like oh he has flicker whisk oh he's waiting to see if i want to bolt his thalia in response sure oh, okay well i'll just blow this bolt now it's like oh i wanted you to blow that bolt because now i'm going to put in this whatever this sanctum prelate or whatever that this is other works. thalia yeah sure <laughs> no that, that's a good point because because again that's one that, that comes up a, a decent amount and it's really non-intuitive like when you first or when you run into it even even if you know what's coming or, or what that means sometimes it, it can it can make you sweat because you're really not ready for it or you're not like you're not prepared because you don't have the right you don't have perfect information so like it's it's always an educated guest at best you know because you haven't seen their draw step and all this and that and there's just there's just things you can't account for so oh. well uh any other any other uh tips tricks strategies ideas phil I, i'm pretty well exhausted what i know about aether vial so i would just end i suppose with what is perhaps historically the most abusable ether vial shenanigan set. It. And that is good old Mangara of Corin. Oh, man. <laughs> while, while Mangara tends to be a little slow for current iterations of Death and Taxes, it is the ultimate grindy ether vial based deck. So for those of you who don't know Mangara, it is a legendary 1-1 one, one for three mana, one mm -hmm. colorless and two white. You can tap it to remove a permanent of your choice and Mangara from the battlefield. However, since it's an activated ability, it can be responded to. So you can activate Mangara, target one of your opponent's permanents, and bounce your Mangara with Caracas. Since the activated ability still has a legal target, it will resolve and exile your opponent's permanent, but Mangara's back in your hand. Mm -hmm. and, and you Aether Violet back in and repeat. And so for the cost of tapping one Caracas and your Aether Vial each turn, you just get to destroy a permanent every turn. Yeah, and most decks can't deal with a once per turn Vindicate. Like That's just game lights out. Especially when it starts going for your lands. Yep. And then you get the flawless victory. You have eaten all of your opponent's creatures, all of their lands. They have seven cards in hand, and they're getting pecked to death by a 2-1 Phyrexian Revoker. Yeah, I believe that's where the uh, Death and Taxes deck got its start, was that that sort of interaction between Mangara, Caracas, and then, and then Aether Vial to sort of accelerate the whole thing. Yeah, uh, if you want to dig into it, there's a uh, there's some history about death and taxes, and the early builds played some uh, very interesting cards that would be considered very very suboptimal by today's standards. Well, one last time, Phil, where could people get information about the history of death and taxes or any other thing that they wanted to know about the deck? If you're looking for anything on death and taxes, my site thravenuniversity.com is where you should be. All right. Well, Phil, I think this episode turned out pretty good. I, I mean, I had a lot of fun. How'd you like it? I mean, I always love talking about this deck and really legacy more generally. So I was uh, very happy to, to spend this time with you just chatting about D&D and Aether Vial and all that shenanigans. Awesome. Yeah, we, I think we hit on all the high points and uh, I dare say we covered most of the corner cases as, as well, even for a card as tricky as Aether Vial. Um, I'd like to thank you for, for joining us today and helping out with the episode. All right. It was great to be here. And for you newer players, um, I recommend that if you want to get really serious about legacy, Study your rules. I became a judge so that I could become a better magic player because how many times did we say the word corner case today? <laughs> too many. Too many. Uh, uh, that's a good point. Thanks for mentioning it. And uh, thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. It has been my pleasure to bring you this episode of Legacies of Lore. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe and feel free to leave us feedback on our YouTube page. Or you can message me directly at mtgtraininggrounds at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook at the user MTG Training Grounds and follow us on Twitter at, at MTG underscore TR Grounds. I'm Zachary Cuck. Thank you for joining.